the, the, you know, crypto anarchy is a scary idea. I think it's like the the notion that you know it's it's what the the law enforcement is is afraid of when they talk about like going dark. Like, what if encryption becomes so powerful and so ubiquitous that we can't you know um, we can't enforce the law, we can't stop terrorists, we um, we can't stop dark web drug markets. The Silk Road was sort of like their nightmare <laughs> yeah. as well. Um, but all of that, you know, the Silk Road is not, I think I mentioned it in the very end of the book because it was just coming to light. And I, of course, was obsessed with the Silk Road. Um, yeah, you were the guy. My, you were the yeah. reporter on that. Um, we'll get to that. But. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that's, th that, that story is really in my next book um, that I'd love to come back and talk about at some point. The, we'll do you know, it. Um, but right, yeah, the, but the first dark web story that I was obsessed with before people really talked about this as the dark web was was WikiLeaks. I mean, WikiLeaks sort of secret ingredient was Tor was, you know, was the dark web, although nobody called it that at that point. When did they come on your radar? Yeah, they, it was with that collateral murder video. So then. So 2010. 2010. Yeah. And and um, and um, I mean, to be fair, like I read uh, a few months later this incredible New Yorker magazine piece about Julian Assange by Rafi Kachatorian, who I think is an amazing writer. And um, that piece was perfectly timed to uh, WikiLeaks release of the Afghan war files. I forgot what they called them. I think like the, yeah, but it was, it was hundreds of thousands of uh, secret files from the war in Afghanistan that were all classified and yet had just somehow WikiLeaks had obtained them and just released them on mass. So that was, and you know, collateral murder was just one video. It was amazing and shocking to see it, but this was like a new, like a new phenomenon. I mean, I call in the book, I called it like a mega leak. And it seemed to me like this idea of, of you, that now you could, I mean, there's, there were a couple of different things happening. There's this like cryptographic anonymity granted to sources, but then there's also just like the, a new kind of digital era of journalism where, uh, you know, journalists can just, I mean, if they, I'm not sure it's always a good idea, but they can just dump reams and reams of secrets online for anybody to dig through, which is, you know, what I think WikiLeaks initially uh, planned to do. I mean, there's, they, they would probably yell at me for saying that because they got in trouble for that and then sort of um, fell back to a system of trying to redact and filter, but you know, arguably they didn't do a great job early on. Um, then by like, so then anyway, so there was the, Af there was this massive leak of Afghanistan files. Sorry. Just keep that, keep that mic a little bit, mm -hmm. you pull it forward maybe a little bit so that you're talking into them. There you go. There was this massive leak of Afghanistan files then there was right after that, uh, or actually, so after the Afghanistan dump, that's when I uh, started trying to make contact with with Julian Assange. I was thinking, like, how do you go about that? <laughs> like, uh, well, let's see. I I believe on the WikiLeaks like WikiLeaks dot org back then, the WikiLeaks website, there was um, an IRC channel back then. Like a, if you remember IRC, it's like the super antiquated instant. It's like kind of the inst the original instant messaging protocol mm. um, before you know. I'm it, not familiar before with that. No. AOL instant messenger or anything. Um, there was IRC, which is what hackers always y used to use um, because it's not controlled by anybody. It's like just a protocol, like email, you know. Mm. And um, there was a WikiLeaks IRC channel, and I just got in there and started asking. I was just like. <laughs> Hey, who can tell me like in here how to talk to Julian Assange? And um, I don't know. I I think I just saw that like there was. I worked at Forbes magazine at the time, and I I could see that like there was. I don't know. I was just I was kind of just really obsessed with with Assange and this idea of WikiLeaks, and I saw that there was like a corporate story here that I could tell for Forbes readers. That's like this is going to matter to big companies as much as as it does to governments. And, did, and so, you, did you have an opinion? I'm sorry to cut in. I yeah, just want yeah. to ask this. Did you have an opinion right away of WikiLeaks or were you, because what one of the things I really like about your reporting is you're a reporter. You like, yeah. and you've said this to me off camera and stuff, talking like you like people to draw their own conclusions on a lot of things. There's things you can inject your opinion on, but overall you like to give the full story and then let people draw away. But were you privately already thinking 
a certain type of way about what WikiLeaks was and what it stood for? I think I was, you know, I, I would, I would say that I was certainly, you know, I always try to be objective and to just tell the story right. as I understand it. Um, but I was certainly supportive because you know, it's hard not to be. WikiLeaks was essentially a journalistic enterprise and I'm a journalist. So, you know, like journalists, you know, the journalists who don't want the truth to come out, you know, it's hard to, I, I don't know if I can re relate to that because it's, that's what makes anybody want to be a journalist is, mm. is having that interest in just like having the story told, like seeing the facts. Um, so I understood that WikiLeaks was dangerous, you know, but I was, I think I, I can't deny that I, I also thought it was really cool and like really, uh, and I was supportive of what Assange was doing. And, and you write for a mainstream publication at the time. You write for Forbes. You can well, take this to a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was thinking like I, I that nobody, uh, you know, the New Yorker had done that excellent piece on on Assange, but it, but I, f I felt like there had not been um, one angle that had not been one slice of it was that that there was not this understanding that Assange um, posed a threat to corporate secrecy too, and he had actually WikiLeaks had earlier released all the files of this Icelandic bank after the the collapse of the Icelandic economy and in the financial crisis. Oh yeah, that was and, like a big thing. And to yeah. me that was like uh that was like proof of concept like oh yeah, this is not just about the US government. Of course that's what everybody's going to be obsessed with right now because I don't know, like when because he's picking a fight with the most powerful institutions right. in the world. But but I saw that like oh, I can I can at least like take that angle and and make this like a unique story for Forbes and Forbes will um, be interested in like you know hopefully putting him on the cover of the magazine and and so that's uh, how how I started thinking about it as I sought him out and and so I was just quickly in this IRC channel like told talk to this guy I, I mean uh, that turned out uh, the guy I was talking to I think he called himself Penguin X and he was this Icelandic. <laughs> kid it turns out and uh that's a very long story he we got time so well he turned out i don't know it's not a story i'm like i relish telling because he turned out to be like a very strange and, and not entirely honest character and eventually um this uh just just for, for anybody who wants to look him up his i i believe his name is sigurdor thordersen but um i will try I'm to not spell great that. at icelandic names <laughs> okay and he turned out to be a mole inside of WikiLeaks. He uh, has been named as like a, uh, he, he is, I, I think he's named as like a, a kind of source, but in the prosecution of WikiLeaks. Oh, wow. Um, but this is long, that was, this is a long time ago. And he was just uh, this Icelandic hacker kid who had befriended Assange. And, uh, and Siggy, as we called him, invited me to, to Iceland and um, told me like, we. We can't tell you like exactly when you can meet with Assange, but I think you'll be able to meet with him if you just like come here, hang out, and like wait for the go ahead. And and it turns out, I mean, I was very happy to do that because uh, at that time it really seemed like WikiLeaks was almost based in Iceland, and there were several people who um, uh, were really high up in you know in this very small organization, high up sounds silly. Like they, but some some of his. Uh, uh, closest associates with at WikiLeaks were in Reykjavik, and and mm. so I was happy to go there and, and interview them and kind of uh, learn more about all their work. And then, how many people would you say were at WikiLeaks at the time? It Ballpark. was really hard to tell, and I think it might have you know they 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 all you know early on uh, it. I think that Assange even invented people uh, that he he played like he, he invented names and um, sure. played different roles to kind of puff up the organization, um, make them seem like they were bigger and stronger uh, than they were. Because I think, among other things, that I, th I think was in designed to as a self-protection mechanism. Um, and I think actually it was very few people. I, I would say like half a dozen yeah, people sounds, who were the sounds, real- That's what I would have guessed. The real um, you know, active members. But I don't know, like I-, I uh, Skipping ahead a bit, like after interviewing Assange, I, you know, he he do, he rarely talks to. Well, how'd you get the? Hold the on same, a second. How'd sure, you how'd sure. you get the interview? So you go to Iceland. You're with Siggy. Yeah, Siggy, and and then also um, 
Brigitte Jon's daughter, who was um, a, a former member of WikiLeaks, who mm. then became a member of Parliament in Iceland, and uh, that's also, an interesting leap. Also, um, oh, I'm terrible with Icelandic names, and it's been a decade, so forgive me. But um, they're kind of second in. I would say Assange's. He became kind of the second in command, and he mm. was a very reputable. And I would say, you know, I was I was impressed with him, and I remain uh, so. Like as a journalist. This um, Icelandic reporter. I'm going to look him up really quick. Go for it. Go for it. We got a second. I'm just. This is. This is such a. I put my phone in airplane mode. I don't. This. Want to do it. This is a continuing, continually evolving story. So it's very interesting. Like I'm a nerd about this. Hearing about some of the early days, and and you were there. So I, I I do like you going into this. I know it was a while ago, but I'll look it up. Keep going. His. Se- it was his second. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what you should even Google to find him. Um, I mean, there was a time I wrote a story for him about him at, for Forbes that was sort of like, now that Assange is in jail, skipping ahead a bit, um, you know, this guy might be the new Assange. But that turned out not to be true. Nobody could be the new Assange. Like, <laughs> Assange, Assange never relinquished any control of WikiLeaks to anyone, I, I think. I see Brigitte John's daughter. Yeah, I, that's that's who, I, she's the one who became the member of parliament. Got it. Um, I see Thordeson, you said him, Sigurd mm-hmm. Thordeson. I don't know if there's another name there, but we'll, we'll, well, we'll go with that. It was the guy who essentially I said nice was the second about him, Even though I forgot his name, <laughs> apologies to him. Um, but he's, he was a great journalist and award-winning journalist, I think for like Icelandic state television, maybe even, mm. or like their sort of whatever, um, BBC kind of. And he worked on collateral murder. I think he went to Iraq to like verify some of the stuff with, uh, regarding that video. The Apache helicopter right, video. The one we watched. He's yeah. a very impressive guy. And anyway, so I, I interviewed these folks and then I got the go ahead that Assange is in London, where it turns out he had been not in London, but nearby, staying on the and the estate of this very wealthy supporter um, whose name I'm forgetting. And uh, he'd been sort of like kind of hiding out uh, because he, by this point, was had been accused of sex crimes in Sweden. And I believe that, you know, at some point there was a red notice for his arrest from I think so, yes. Europol or Interpol. Yes. Um, and and so it was a bit like it was it definitely did feel very cloak and dagger. I and I met with him in his house in, in London. Um we actually we met in the home of the of the like British photographer who we had hired to to shoot him and she just very kindly like allowed us to, you know, to use her place to uh, do this interview and and what was it i mean going to yeah. see him was it like he got dropped off at a unspecified time and location across the street or and then came in the back door or like how cloak and dagger are we talking when it actually got to the point of interview well i think i just i was just waiting for him and then he showed up he was with sarah harrison who mm. um was a uh kind of i mean just this sounds i'm sorry this sounds um meaning but I, she seemed to be his assistant it turns out or maybe later became really instrumental at wikileaks did an incredible work for the the group i'm sure was actually doing amazing work at the time but you know was assange is, is like it, it may have been just that he is not he he's not the kind of guy who like uh manages his own calendar not because he's a, like a ceo but because he's such a uh He's just not in that kind of headspace, you know. Sure, like, I he's think got he's, a lot going on. He's and he's just a a geek's geek, you know. Like he, uh, so she, I, I was just she, she was sort of like wrangling him, you mm. know. But uh, yeah, and then and then, but he was, uh, you know, he struck me as like very friendly, a little strange, you know. I, I interview like a lot of people um, who are hackers and. Um, brilliant technical people and you know there you can um i I don't want to like diagnose him and this is but it's but he you know on on the spectrum i think is like one way to describe it uh he knew where you were going with that he just like you know he like made weird jokes that nobody understood and um and but was sort of charming in in that way like i found him very likable and um he was really uh, very like uh, strangely warm and um, and seemed eager to talk, almost flattered mm. at this point because he just wasn't you know on the same level of celebrity as he 
Uh, he would be still later, though, you know. Still, though, he had already released some of the stuff. Right, yeah. Like, they were known, you know. I think, I, though, that I'm almost surprised at that. He, you know, he, he showed up wearing a, a suit, and it was the first time I'd ever, I'd ever seen him in a suit. And I think, you know, at the time, I was like, oh, this is, this is, like, cool. He, and he, he, he clearly, like, I later learned, I think, that, like, somebody had sent him to a tailor and paid for him to have a suit mm. because he never, you know, worn a suit in his life probably thank you for watching the video guys please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below